internet and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That Supreme Court Saturday. As always, I'm your host Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about intellectual property. Intellectual property is a company's ability to own certain attributes or ideas and many argue it spurred innovation in the arts, medicine and that guy in a puffy jacket that says Rolex to you at 1 in the morning as you're walking home. As you can imagine, limiting what someone can and can't say or manufacture based on prior ownership of an idea by a company might not exactly click perfectly with the ideals of the Constitution. So let's jump right in with the Constitution itself, specifically the Copyright Clause, which says, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing the limited times to authors and investors to the exclusive right of their respective writings and discoveries. Now is it ironic that I just ripped this straight off of the constitution? Probably, but these words have revolutionized the better part of American industry for over 200 years. So let's get started with 1879's trademark cases. This is actually three cases blended into one and regarded the counterfeiting of trademarks for selling champagne and whiskey. Much like what would happen if you actually mix champagne and whiskey, this ruling was hard to swallow and quickly thrown out. The Supreme Court ruled that the copyright clause gave Congress no power to protect and regulate trademarks. Wow, this is going to be a short episode. This brings us to a case that between 18, 1984 and 2004 was cited in over 130 court decisions. 1880s Baker vs. Selden. In 1859, Charles Selden got a copyright for his book called Selden's Condensed Ledger or Bookkeeping Simplified. Because when you want to get a copyright for something, it's great to give it multiple names to make things as simple as possible. The book described an improved system of bookkeeping and contained about 20 pages of primarily bookkeeping forms with only 650 words. Unsurprisingly, these books did not do so well. What? No one wanted to buy a book of bookkeeping forms? What kind of world are we living in? In 1867, Baker published his own accounting book with similar methodology because it's accounting. How radical can you really get? Now he was sued, forcing the Supreme Court to determine the difference between copyrights and patents. It was decided that while no one has a right to print or publish the book or any material part thereof, the copyright of a book on bookkeeping cannot secure the exclusive rights to make, sell, or use accounting books prepared upon the plan set forth in such a book. Man, I'm glad that having written a book on something does not give you legal rights over everyone who does it. Otherwise, I'd owe the author of the Kama Sutra a ton of money. This brings us to the interesting case of 1894's Schillinger vs. United States. John Schillinger figured out a way to improve concrete pavement, and it was working well. So well, actually, that the architect of the US Capitol just kinda did it without acknowledging the patent. I mean, you're making a building for Congress, the building that enforces patent protections. Who would sue you? Whoop, Schillinger, that's who. He literally sued America for stealing his patent, hence the case's name, Schillinger vs. United States. The court ruled that the United States had sovereign immunity and could only be sued if it gave consent, which not exactly leaping at the prospect of losing more money on the capitalist building construction, Congress did not consent. In 2006, an addendum to the court procedure was made so that if the government stole your patent, you actually could sue them for compensation, but that hasn't really panned out for many companies yet. This brings us to 1908's Continental Paper Bag Co. vs. Eastern Paper Bag Co. Yes, we're entering the high stakes world of pre-plastic bagging. Back then they asked, paper or figure it out on your own. Eastern Paper Co. sued its competitor, Continental Paper Co., alleging that Continental Paper was using their patent for a self-opening paper bag. Which, man, you've been staring at a paper bag for too long when you're coming up with ideas like that. The question here wasn't whether Continental Paper Bag was infringing on their patent, but whether you could use a patent to suppress competition when you yourself aren't using the patent in any of your products. It turns out that 
Once you own the patent, you can do whatever you want with it. In Eastern Paper Bag, the patent holder won the case. Now this brings us to the controversial case of 1918's International News Service versus Associated Press. Now I love this case. Back in the day you had two news sources, the INS and the AP, and back then print media was booming. It was the height of World War I and whoever could get the news out the fastest got the business. The United States found William Randolph Hearst's reporting for the INS to be too unfavorable to the Allies, so they barred the newspaper from receiving Allied telegraph lines to report on the news. So what do you do when you no longer have primary sources? Well, you steal information from your opponent and report it as your own. INS gained access to AP News through sneaking peeks at the AP's bulletin board and acquiring early editions of AP newspapers. AP quickly caught on and sued INS saying, hey, these are our facts, get your own. Interestingly enough, the AP won the case, but not in the way that would require me to shut down this channel, as I'm currently reporting from Wikipedia. It was deemed that the information respecting current events contained in the library production is not the creation of a writer, instead it's public information. The INS was charged with misappropriation and it was deemed that due to the tenuous value of hot news, there was a narrow period for which the proprietary right would apply. This brings us to 1938's Kellogg Co. vs. National Biscuit Co. This case has been called the Supreme Court's most versatile and influential trademark decision. So National Biscuit Co., which later got shortened to Nabisco, owned a patent on shredded wheat. Only problem, that patent had expired. So when Kellogg started releasing their own shredded wheat snacks and Nabisco sued them, they had to go through some serious stretches of logic to come up with an argument. The basic idea was that, using the INS case we just talked about, Nabisco argued that they had put in the legwork of developing the shredded wheat brand and that Kellogg was just reporting it. Because the Supreme Court knew what a patent was, that argument didn't work. And from that point onward, when a patent expired, the invention became public use. Which, for whatever reason, just blew the minds of legal people at the time. Next to 1947's International Salt Co. vs. United States. This case really kicks off a transition in intellectual property decisions from deciding what a patent is to punishing antitrust violators. Oddly enough, this case against a salt company really set the stage for a lot of future cases against tech companies, which makes sense in the strange legal world the Supreme Court lives in. So International Salt had patented machines that process salt and mix it in with food, which is hugely successful because it was the late 40s and we had just invented fast food, which really relied on salt to hide the distinct taste of buying meat from the lowest bidder. The problem lay with the fact that only its salt could work with its machine, and as it didn't own a patent on salt, this was deemed to constitute a lack of competition. Which brings us to 1973's United States vs. Glaxo Group Limited. Two companies, Imperial Chemical Industries, <laughs> they sound trustworthy, and Glaxo owned patents covering various aspects of antifungal drugs. Separately controlling all aspects of creating the drug, they worked together to ensure that no other companies could get the finished form of the drug, which led them to dominate the antifungal market. Now this may sound like a clear cut case of antitrust, but remember, what is the point of a patent? To have a temporary monopoly over a specific product. This would be like accusing an investment bank of trying to make money at the expense of society. Their response, to quote improv comedians would be, Yes, and? In this case, the court said we do not recognize unlimited authority of the government to attack a patent based on antitrust claims on the simple assertion that the patent is invalid. But if the government could provide substantial claims to the need of relief, they need to have the ability to step in. While this case didn't actually change much, it gave the government the permission to invalidate patents something that the government has used exactly once in a case so insignificant it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. This brings us to 2003's Eldridge vs. Ashcroft. In 2003, Congress passed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, 
which extended existing copyright terms by an additional 20 years. Which makes me happy that the Sonny Bono household got an additional 40 cents from the one time they accidentally played a Sonny Bono song on the radio in 2001. Now, if this seems unnecessary, considering it was extending copyright for 20 years from 75 years to 95 years, specifically for content created before 1978, just remember that, in a completely unrelated note, every Disney character was about to go into the public domain. Ho ho! Mickey Mouse did not like that. The case was challenged and taken to the Supreme Court. While some argued that this was a violation of free speech, Justice Ginsburg, relying on early copyright acts, saw that the copyright clause we talked about at the top of the episode stated that Congress can set whatever time limits they want for copyright as long as it's not forever. And thus, the Term Extension Act is constitutional. Which is good, because I would hate to see Walt Disney turning over in his grip cryogenically frozen test tube. This brings us to 2007's Microsoft Corp vs AT&T Corp. Oh man, this is like watching Godzilla fight Mothra. You see, AT&T owned a patent for a program that could compress recorded speech on a computer, and Microsoft used a near identical program in their master version of Windows that they shipped internationally to be replicated and distributed. It seemed like a pretty open and shut case, with local and federal courts siding with AT&T. But Microsoft kept appealing its way up the chain to the Supreme Court, which actually found in their favor, because it was found that digital software code was an idea, and only a component of a larger patented project. Which is important, because these patented products were being made internationally and not sold in the US, meaning that they were subject to international patent law enforcement. To which China said, yeah, we'll get right on that. Right after we catch Sunbucks Coffee, John Daphne Tenderness Whiskey, and of course the coveted Calvin Klein Collection. This brings us to 2010's Bilski vs. Kapos, which brought into question a test for determining whether something could be patented or not. The machine or transformation test. The basic idea to this test was that you could only get a patent for something only if it is implemented by a particular machine in a non-conventional and non-trivial manner. Meaning that I couldn't just like tape a screwdriver to the side of a car and be like, hey, it's a car screwdriver, now give me a patent. Or transformed an article from one state to another. Meaning that I couldn't mix Clorox and Drano and call it my own magical bleach. I had to actually create my own secret sauce. Now this test that was used by patent offices for half a century made it very hard to patent software and different intellectual processes. In this case, the Supreme Court was ruling against a prospective patent for hedging someone's investment losses in one segment of the energy industry by making investments in other segments of the energy industry. Wow, what a genius you must be! You figured out diversifying investments all by yourself? The Supreme Court simultaneously said that this patent request was not legitimate and that the machine or transformation test could not rule whether applying for a patent got you one or not, but should be treated rather as a suggestion. This brings us perfectly to 2014's Alice Corp vs CLS Bank International. This really built on the case we just talked about in the realm of, can you patent abstract ideas? In this case, Alice had invented an escrow account, in which two participants who want to pay each other money can exchange money once they've both paid into a common account. Such a good idea, in fact, that it's been used for over a hundred years. That said, the nuance was they had patented the idea of online escrow. Pretty much every company that ever had a website provided a brief to the Supreme Court for why this patent was a bad idea including Amazon who had also patented one-click shopping. Yes, all the way back in 1999, Amazon was granted sole ownership of the concept of clicking one button to complete an online shopping order. Oh man, had that ever passed the machine or transformation test? We'll never know. Although, I have one guess. Anyways, the Supreme Court nulled this patent. This brings us to the final case of the night. The epic battle of 2016's Apple Inc vs Samsung Electronics Co. These cases were fought in more countries than there were fronts in World War II, 
with cases in South Korea, Japan, Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Australia, Britain, and the US, which actually saw multiple cases and retrials. Now we'll just focus on the Supreme Court case though. The basic idea was that Apple had patented the shape of their iPhone as well as the iPhone's user interface. And when Samsung released the i9000 Galaxy S, they thought it looked too similar so they sued. Apple actually submitted images of the two phones to the court because apparently no one had an i9000 Galaxy S. Local courts ruled in favor of Apple making Samsung pay them $400 million. But then the images were found to be doctored and the Supreme Court oversaw a retrial that unanimously favored Samsung because under their understanding, the patents applied to the case and the screen and not to the smartphone itself. So that's what the constitution thinks about intellectual property today. Thank you for watching and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Supreme Court Saturday, click here. Please like and subscribe and if you're really a fan, you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party down there.